you may be wondering what a video about Neanderthals and really other hominins is doing on this channel. And I, I want to save that as a mystery until the end of the video. I've got a picture of a wood woes there in the foreground. A woes was a character from German, from European mythology, a man of the forest covered with hair, sometimes with moss or leaves, uh, that was a human-like creature that was not human. And I think this one is carved into a church or something in Germany. And of course, we that's one of the least common of this category of beings that people in older times believed in. Uh, there are also satyrs, which the Arabs and the Jews have a very similar word that sort of means the same kind of beast. And then up in Scandinavia, there were trolls. And trolls were, were brutish, unintelligent, usually had large noses, you know, just primitive in their technology. But all these were in a category of, that the ancients had that science today seems to be trying to get rid of or, or brush under the carpet. And that is things that are like us, that are interested in us, perhaps, but yet are not us. And when you see, whenever you see this in science, whenever you see science is trying to blur distinctions, instead of making distinctions clearer and clearer, it is a red flag. It is a red flag that real science is being replaced with something else, with an agenda. And in this case, there, I, I had this idea in my mind for some time, but I recently saw an article that confirmed what I was thinking. I was thinking this is a red flag, there's something wrong here, they're determined to make uh, a Homo sapiens, is a Neanderthal, is a Denisovan, you know, oh gee, the Neanderthals are so much like us, uh, they were really just another kind of human. I, I think they've made art. You know, I, I think you, you've seen it, that most people today, outside of Sub-Sahara Africa, they carry Neanderthal genes. You've probably seen all those claims. I don't believe any of them are true, and I'm going to make the case for that. I'm gonna make the case using science that the mainstream has the science wrong. You know, they can get it wrong, folks. They can get it wrong, and on this one, they have, and if you, you give me just a little bit of your time, I want to show you how. Now, this is an article from Sapiens Magazine, which came out late last year uh, from Dr. Schwartz, and it, it's called The Humans We Haven't Met Yet. So the title, again, promotes this idea that, well, they were really just so much like us. We're all humans. All these large-brained, two-legged creatures walking around that were making tools. They're all humans, and we're just a different kind of human. I, but is that really true? When we say that someone is inhuman, do we mean that they cannot make a flint scraper? No. That is not how we define humanity in our everyday use. And even here in this article, you know, he starts off by saying everything that's been called Homo sapiens isn't. And he said that basically too many things have been lumped together, like Homo sapiens, Neanderthal, instead of Homo sapiens, we're Homo sapiens sapiens, and Neanderthals are Homo sapiens, Neanderthalus, and, and so on and so forth, Homo sapiens, Denisovus, whatever. And he makes the case in this article even though the title, the editorial title, keeps with this, uh, I will call it an agenda, an agenda to make us think that humanity did not come about as a distinct population. We just happen to be the lucky survivors of a bunch of very similar beings. And I, I, I don't, I believe that humanity is a distinct population. However we got here, we are a distinct population. And I'm gonna make that case at least I'm going to make the case that we've got Neanderthals wrong. The same applies to the other 
creatures in that category. And he goes on to this article, and I'm going to put a link to this article in the description section of the video. Because as he goes on, he traces the history of it, and it's really quite shocking. He said, you know, in the, in the 30s, uh, there were a, a paleontologists was arguing that Neanderthals needed to be in their own genus, that they were that different than us, that they needed to be in a, in a completely separate genus, not even a homo. And, but then World War II came around, and Hitler had this theology that the Germans were the master race. And there was actually, and he, he re, speaks of this in the article, there's political pressure to just lump everything together and to say these are all humans. We're all kinds of humans. Because if you start making too big a, a distinctions and separating them too much, then that could be taken a little further and say, well, you know, we've got this kind of human in, among living people today. You, you could take it too far and use it to promote Hitler's agenda. And so what he was saying was that it became politicized. The science became politicized in such a way that they wanted to, to push the agenda that Neanderthals are so much like us. Now, I think that agenda has continued for other reasons, but again, I will let you look at that. Uh, I'll put a link to that article. You can read it for yourself in the description section of the video. Now, in an effort to humanize Neanderthals, they've given them credit for all sorts of things that are very questionable. Uh, a couple of years ago, they, they come up with this article that said, did, did Neanderthals make art? And they found this artwork in, a, in several caves in Spain, which they dated to be over 60,000 years old, which they showed that there were, or they believed that there were no modern humans in Spain 60 something thousand years ago. And so they, they said, you know, this artwork, Neanderthals were the only thing there, so they must have made this artwork Look how much like us they are. However, I, I want you to look at this artwork that they found this cave very closely. You can see that th there's sort of a, a red blob there at the top. You can barely see that the first rectangle is cut out about where the shoulders would be. Then there's a larger square or rectangle in the middle, a small one at the end. So basically three rectangular shapes lined up a line running down one side, but over on one shoulder, it's almost like it sweeps over. And I know it's hard to see on the, the resolution of the picture that I have here, but these are a series of dots, round dots painted a certain way, sort of swooping down. And this is part of what they found in this Spanish cave that they said, oh, well, this must be Neanderthals. Now I wanna show you another picture here. You see this? This is what is called a Spanish tectiform. A Spanish tectiform. This is one of 32 symbols that modern humans in Europe used around 35,000 years ago and they used the same symbols all across Western Europe for thousands of years. Modern humans did this around 35,000 years ago, almost as if they had some sort of way to communicate or some shared code or language. And I'm going, to, I'm going to come back to that. But notice how much it looks like. It looks just basically like a more finished version of what they found in the cave. You've got the three rectangles. You've got the swooping with the dots on the side. You've got the one extended leg out, it, it looks a whole lot like an early version of what we know modern humans did. And Neanderthals have never been credited with anything like this after that. So in order to push this agenda that Neanderthals made art, the researchers had to overlook the fact that undoubtedly modern humans came along and made this art in this same area 30,000 years, 15, 25, 30,000 years later. Maybe even, maybe 
20,000 years later. They had to ignore that. They had to ignore the similarities and that no Neanderthals before or since had ever done anything like it. But yet somehow modern humans just happened to come up with the same symbol to use 20 to 30 something thousand years later. You think they might have mentioned that. And there has been a little bit of pushback against this claim in, in science journals. And I'm glad because the claim is just so, so outrageously false. And I'm going to show you, if you think this is convincing, wait until you see what is next. Do you see these handprints over on the left-hand side? One of them, the paint has sort of come off. But it's sort of a sh shadow of a handprint outlined in red paint or ochre. And what they, how this is done is some ochre or some paint is put in a hollow reed. The person holds their hand not quite against the cave wall, but close to the cave wall. And then they, they blow out the red paint so that it makes an outline of their hand. And I think you can see two, two examples there. These two are from 44,000 years ago in Indonesia. But my friends, the very same type of handprint made the same way can be found throughout Western Europe during the same period. Maybe these might be a little bit earlier actually than the ones in Europe, maybe a thousand or 2000 years earlier. But if you go to Europe 40,000 years ago, you see the same symbols. So it's almost like there was a unified, because th this is one of the 32 symbols that humans all over Western Europe had done. This one is even done in Indonesia. So we can see that much later, the, the scientists are claim, claim these Neanderthals did this cave art 60 something thousand years ago in Spain. And ca cave art, caves are very hard to date. So they can make a mistake on the cave art. They can make a mistake about when humans came along. And I'm saying they, they have made a mistake and they should have known that it was a mistake. You've got these handprints in France. You've got the handprints in Spain. You've got the handprints in Indonesia, all made by modern humans. But yet they're saying that these handprints in Spain, this is from the same three caves in Spain that they found the other stuff. It's, it's art that they are also dating to 60 something thousand years ago. And they're claiming that it was done by Neanderthals. And that is incorrect. And I'm not an expert in the field, but you don't have to be. You just have to open your eyes and use a little common sense. These handprints in this cave in Spain that they're attributing to Neanderthals are almost identical. They're the same technique. They're the same thing. It's what is found in Western Europe by other modern humans later and what is found in Indonesia. It's like there was one global human culture or I say global, basically it stretched from Spain to Indonesia and that belt for 40,000 years ago. A common, some common things in their culture. But folks, these handprints were not made by Neanderthals. And if, if you look at Neanderthal anatomy, you do not have to be an expert to know it. I want you to notice the breadth of the palms here in these handprints and the straightness of the thumb in these handprints and the delicacy or the uh, tiny, the small ends of the fingers in these handprints. Breadth of the palm, straightness of the thumb and tips of the fingers. Now let's look at the skeleton of an early modern human hand and a Neanderthal hand. A couple of things jump out at you immediately. Uh, one is that the breadth of the palm in the modern human is much wider. The distance from the end of the hand across the palm to where the, the thumb is, down at the base of the thumb bone, is much broader in the humans. It's like in the Neanderthals, it's all sort of scrunched up. So they would have narrower palms even while they had much thicker knuckles. Look at what would be uh, not only the knuckles, but that the end of the first digit in the Neanderthal hand. Look at the size of those knobs. 
compared to the size of the knobs at the at the extended end of the first digit in the human fingers. So they had much bigger, clunkier hands with much narrower palms. Notice that the uh, basal thumb bone of the Neanderthal is very bent, short and bent, compared to the straight thumb of the human. And here's the kicker. Look at the tips of the fingers. Now, I, I understand that a couple of the tips of the fingers are missing here, but you can see the thumb bone uh, had that tip there is much, much larger, maybe double the size of the human bone. And the Neanderthal bone has a, an end on the index finger and on the long middle finger. Uh, and you can see that compared to the human hand, they're just much larger. They're thicker, they're broader. Uh, compare the pinky, the, that little bone at the end of the pinky compared to the little bone at the end of the human hand. It's just, again, it's massive in size. Their hands don't look like our hands. These hands, found in the cave art in Spain, 60 something thousand years ago, they claim, look a lot like these hands and the other hands that are found in Europe, unquestionably done by modern humans thousands of years after this cave art was discovered. So they've got it wrong. Either there were modern humans in Spain earlier than they thought, or the cave art is misstated, which is very easy to do. And I think uh, some outfits have taken some, tried to redate and, and recreate their work and they found a younger date. But the damage is done. The canard the, that, oh, Neanderthals made art, is just, it's just out there because they repeated it a million times. And the evidence for it was, you can see it, it falls apart easily. It, you don't have to be an expert to see that these trained scientists let their agenda, let them get carried away. Now, so far what I've shown you is basically disproving the idea that, oh, Neanderthals were so much like us. They're not so much like us. You can see it in the hand bone. You can see that the works that are attributed to them are very different. Sometime Google Upper Paleolithic Revolution and look at the tools of the Upper Paleolithic Revolution, which is when modern humans came along and compare that to the tools that were used before. There is just a quantum difference in the fineness and the delicacy of the tools all happened about the same time, maybe 50, 55,000 years ago, all these changes. But I, I want to go beyond that. I want to, because the people say, well, science has proven that Eurasians carry genes, 1.5% of their genes from Neanderthals. And so we must not have been that different. This is another one of those things that everybody knows that isn't so. Friends, They've, they've got that wrong. I, they've repeated it until it's in this box in, in people's heads. Oh, this is something that everybody knows is true because of science. They've got it wrong. And I'm not saying that on my own authority. There's a Cambridge professor, Dr. William Amos. Impeccable credentials has been published numerous times. But when he found a better explanation for the so-called Neanderthal genes in Eurasians, he really struggled to get a fair hearing after years of trying. Like if he, if some of his other work, if he wanted a paper published, he could get it published. This one, they, they, in my opinion, jacked him around. And they finally have let him pu publish a couple of these papers. The first one, they made him like soften everything and, and not use, in my opinion, some of his best evidence. But what I'm going to put a link to his page, uh, his research gate page, which shows Neanderthal intergression, a case of smoke and mirrors. And this Cambridge professor has study after study where, and some of it is very technical, but I'm going to give you the highlights here. One thing he's done is he used the same statistical techniques they use to quote, prove, unquote, that Neanderthals uh, intergressed and interbred with modern humans and that we today carry some of those genes. And then he used the same techniques with 
orangutans and humans, gorillas and humans, chimps and humans. And the way the stats were interpreted, all three of those modern, uh, modern humans carry genes from them due to aggression. In other words, the test they're using, if you, if you do it on things that you know are not related and that you know cannot interbreed, because we do not even have the same number of chromosomes as those creatures, uh, it gives false positives. And then he proposed another explanation because he realized something. He realized that uh, small populations that are very homozygous, that is, they do not have a lot of genetic diversity, those populations have a low, low mutation rate. Genes that are alike, they don't mutate very much. Genes that are different mutate more and faster. And, and so what he realized was uh, Sub-Saharan Africans had a much larger population with a lot more diversity. The group that left Africa, or either left Africa or depending on how you look at it, was just there. It was a much smaller group. It was a much more homogenous group. It had a much lower diversity and so it couldn't evolve as much. It couldn't, it did not mutate as much. And so what you're looking at is not humans came into uh, Eurasia and made it with Neanderthals, but that Neanderthals were also this kind of population. They were a small group. They had, if they had a gene that had a mutation in it, they didn't have a big pool of gene to help wipe that mutation out they had to keep the mutation because they just they didn't have much and they if they had the mutation probably the person they married had the mutation because it was a small population same thing happened with the modern humans out of Africa their genes some of them had the same mutations that the Neanderthals had and they they couldn't lose them either but in, in Africa they did they evolved away from uh, this whole host of genes that are that are usually deleterious, mildly, mild. Most Neanderthal, so-called Neanderthal genes in humans, are mildly deleterious. So, Dr. Amos has done a number of tests. He has a long list of papers there, and basically testing for which explanation what best explains the genes in Eurasians that people are saying are from Neanderthal and aggression. And what he found was. And, and he approached the problem from many different ways, but every one of them pointed to the same result. The idea that best explains these so-called Neanderthal genes is that we, we Eurasians evolved slower and we couldn't lose our little mutations that we had. Whereas in Africa, there was a bigger gene pool and those mutations just got swallowed up by the proper gene by whatever gene was basal. So that's one aspect of it. There's a couple of, so, and he, but he says that explains basically the whole signal. And he's not saying that maybe never, never modern humans and Neanderthals ever made it, but maybe that there was some sort of uh, uh, impediment or maybe they didn't have, their offspring were not fertile. There was reduced fertility. There was, there was some sort of hybrid barrier there. And so that the genes that we have today are not from Neanderthal and aggression. They're from the fact that we evolved slowly because we were a homozygous group compared to Sub-Saharan Africans who had lots of diversity. And when two diverse genes try to get together, the odds of a mutation increase. So uh, if that were the only explanation, it would explain basically all the signal, but it is not. I'm going to put this JSTAR link, and I'll, I'll put a link to Dr. Amos's page in the description section of the video too. And if you really want to study it, if you really want to take the red pill on this, go look at some of his studies. And, and many of them, you will need a science background to understand what he's saying. Many of his tests are very clever, very subtle. Uh, a lot of his statistical analysis, in the same way they came to the conclusion that we have Neanderthal and aggression. He used some of the same statistical methods to show that uh, they're just closing their eyes to a better explanation of the same data. But you know, uh, my, 
my only complaint is he's not going far enough. He knows that what I'm about to say next is out there, but he doesn't highlight it. Maybe because it, he's got such a, he's got a royal flush basically with the hand he's got. He doesn't need to say any more. He just needs people to fairly consider what he's already done and they're not doing it. They're sticking with the narrative. But I've got a study here up on the screen and I will put this link in there in the description section as well. It says Neanderthal and woolly mammoth molecular resemblance. Genetic similarities may underlie cold adaptation suite. And what the article does and what the study does is show how mammoths and Neanderthals had several of the same mutations in the same genes. Now I ask you, my friends, is that because they interbred or is that because they lived in the same environment and adapted to the same conditions? In other words, it's convergent evolution and the molecular level. Whatever happened to convergent evolution? Somehow, when the subject is Neanderthal and Denisovan in aggression, it all just goes away and they, they pretend it doesn't exist and that, that any genetic similarities between us and Neanderthals must be because we, our ancestors interbred. And the idea that our genes evolved to look more similar because we were living in more similar environments, it just it seems to never be considered in this one area. Now they'll, they'll use convergent evolution whenever they need to, if you're talking about you know, dolphins and sharks or what have you. But for some reason, it's never considered for this, and it should be. Sub-Saharan Africans were exposed to different pathogens, different diseases, different environmental conditions, and so their genes, in particular their immune system, evolved in one direction, and the people who went were in Eurasia and spread out across Eurasia, they faced another set of pathogens, another set of diseases, another set of environmental conditions and the ones that they faced were the same as those that the Neanderthals faced. So yes, some of their genes mutated in a similar direction. It doesn't mean they interbred. It doesn't mean they were the same thing any more than Neanderthals and woolly mammoths having the same genes means that they were the same thing. We, we've got it. We've got it wrong. We've got it wrong. And that doesn't even include, you know, genes through viral load and what have you, but I, I'm starting to spend too much time here. I think I need to wrap it up. There are other studies, which I will also, I, I'm going to send, I did a write up on some of these articles and I will put those links in the uh, comments or the description section of the video as well. But uh, you know, like I've got one on how Neanderthals breathed and they did not even breathe like we do. Their spine was not like ours. They, the, the, the way their back was, the, the, our vertebrae has a sway in it and, and theirs did not. Their ribs do not expand with their diaphragm when they breathe. I mean, they were just very different creatures. Here you see a Neanderthal skull versus a human skull. It, it would not shock me if the Scandinavian legends of trolls, for example, were some sort of a distant memory of a relic population of these creatures that their ancestors you know found when they got to Scandinavia I it when if I saw something like that you know it or if you saw something that different from us would you just assume hey that's a different it's really they're just so much like us no it'd be the stuff of nightmares but, but there's no anyway I, I'm gonna show all these links and, and now I want to get to the, the final thing, the reason why am I doing this? Why am I? Basically, I just want to talk about how early Genesis points to Christ. That's what this whole channel is about. Why am I taking my time out to just give you a little bit, not even a lot, but just a little bit of the reason why science is wrong about Neanderthals? And I'm going to tell you the reason. It's because Christians have bought into this and they are using that so-called fact to drive their theology more than they should. They're trying to change their theology in some way that accounts for the fact that 
uh, humanity doesn't seem to be a very distinct population that we interbred with all these other creatures for so long and what have you and uh, you know the christ-centered model which is the model that's in the, in the book I've, I've written it really is not anti-evolution but it is procreationism and the place where it is most at variance with what science claims is with man himself what i believe genesis says about man is the opposite of this narrative that is being pushed about well really we're not all that special there were other creatures around that were just so much like us the interbred with us and most of us carry parts of them in our genome so on and so forth folks i don't believe that narrative and i've give i've shown you just the tip of the iceberg why i think science has that wrong i think there's a lot that science has right that many christians need to accept like the age of the universe the role in evolution at, in some things but not when it comes to man i am i'm saying all these things because i want you to understand they've got the narrative wrong on this one it, and if it, it fits when i say the christ-centered model reconciles science to scripture when you look at even early genesis through the lens of christ it just effortlessly resolves all these so-called conflicts between science and scripture i say that but it doesn't resolve at the conflict where i think science has got it wrong and where i think science has got it wrong is with humanity i do think i don't think uh, that Adam and Eve were the first couple. I think they were already people produced by a divine act in the world, maybe long before Adam. Uh, more about that in the book, but that's not to say uh, we just sort of came from this polyglot of things that kept breeding with each other and really the other things were so much like us and we're not, not distinct and we're not special. We are distinct we are special the paleontological record shows that the genetic record if you correctly would show that and the bible teaches that so anyway there's the science my real passion is the scripture it's just that this mistaken view of these other critters was getting in the way it's getting in the way and I don't want it to I don't want anything to get in the way of how early Genesis points to Christ because it does it is a miracle it is something that Christians should rejoice about and non-believers should consider